You've just entered the Disaster Tough podcast, the place for emergency managers, first responders, and humanitarians who want to get the job done. Stories, lessons, and tips are provided by field experts. I'm your host, John Scardina, owner of Doberman Emergency Management and former federal emergency response official who's responded to some of the most extreme disasters. Disaster Tough is our mantra. It combines experience, training, and analytics in order to be successful at any stage within the disaster life cycle. It means being a professional in emergency and disaster services. Doberman Emergency Management lives by this. If your organization needs to fill a gap, please contact us. We can help. Contact info is in the show notes. We also support other products and organizations that will increase your ability. For example, if you fight wildfires, hurricanes, a pandemic, any disaster in the field, at a hospital or command center, listen up. You're missing out if you do not use L3 Harris for your radio comms. They are secure, portable, mobile, and scalable, which is great news for us in the field. A truly disaster tough radio system. Check out the XL family of radios by clicking on the show notes or simply go to L3Harris.com. When you think of situational awareness, you need to think of Futurity IT. They are disaster tough because they saw a gap and figure out how to close it by creating the Orion and Athena applications. Situational awareness is all about speed, coordination, and accuracy of information. Futurity IT's Orion app collects and provides preliminary damage assessments and integrates all incident action plan documents with WebEOC. The Athena app allows for planning, contact tracing, and customizable group coordination in every single phase of the disaster lifecycle. The best part? Futurity IT made both applications extremely intuitive. It's so easy to use. Click on the show notes today to schedule a free demo. Welcome back to the show, everybody. It's your host, John Scardina. I am so excited for this episode. Man, this has been a long time coming. I've actually been trying to find the most interesting man in the world. I think I found him. Eric Helpenstell. His name literally says help. Helpenstell. He's been all over the globe doing all kinds of really cool stuff. Been on a million different projects, and he's truly a subject matter expert in emergency management and response. Eric, welcome to the show. Thanks, John. It's good to see you again. Yeah, it's good to see you too. So for those who don't know, Eric and I went to Georgetown. I've had a few people from Georgetown on here in my master's program. And uh, it shows like really the validity. I'm, I'm basically a running advertisement for, for Georgetown because like I keep on meeting uh, because of Georgetown, I've met so many really interesting people and you're definitely like the top tier. And um, I remember going down to uh, Louisiana with the group and you're a really interesting guy because, you know, most people who like, who've been, who've been like all over the place, kind of like me, to be honest, arrogant, like kind of like tout it. And we're like driving down the road along the bay and uh, in Louisiana. And you're like, Oh yeah, I would just, uh, I did deep water horizon. And we're all like, wait, what? And uh, you probably all of a sudden I just started hearing all these amazing stories. And so I just kind of want to start with that because I believe it happened in April. So we're like 11 years out from when it happened, obviously lots of actor actions, can you talk to us about that experience at, at Deepwater Horizon, and then we kind of just kick it off from there? Sure, sure. So uh, April 10th, the, uh, the uh, Deepwater Horizon, a driller rig owned by Transocean, uh, got overwhelmed by, by pressure, and uh, we all know what happened from there. So uh, I got deployed about a, geez, three days later, and I uh, got picked up directly by BP on contract. There's nothing we could do for the rig at that point because it had sank, and uh, we switched immediately into uh, recovery, oil recovery. And uh, that sucker took, I mean, I can't remember how long, I was there for four months before I moved on to the next oil spill project, and it was still going strong when I got reassigned to another project. Um, yeah. But the, I, I, that's the, 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 the BP spill, the Deepwater Horizon spill, is the spill that reset everything. Before that, it was, you know, everybody talked Valdez, 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 and after that, it was, it was BP that it reset as the new standard, as the new worst case. Uh, I've seen the movie Deepwater Horizon, and when I, when I watched that movie... Uh, Matt Damon. No, it's not Matt Damon. Who's uh, who's the lead actor in that? Uh, that guy from. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, Wahlberg. Wahlberg. Yeah. Every time I yeah. see that, I, every time I see that movie, I'm like, oh, that's Eric. So uh, yep. you basically <laughs> uh, you did so. Pretty awesome. Um, sure. Hey, just random random thought here. How accurate was Deepwater Horizon to what you know about? 
Well, from uh, from what I've talked to the guys that were on the rig and uh, some people I've worked with, uh, you know, the uh, you know they they took a lot of poetic license and in, uh, in the putting that movie together. But mm. uh, you know, it's it's rough work. Those roughnecks and those guys working on the rigs, they sure earn their money. Yeah, I mean, they they earn that for sure. I mean, tough work. Yeah. Um, Man, but tough disaster too. Talk about the complexities of that. I mean, you've been on a lot of disasters where it's been complex, like geopolitically co- uh, complex with uh, yeah. dealing with um, response during war, which is nuts, to oil spills to the Gulf. Um, that's just wild to like even to think about because most of my so uh, National I'm at West, the team I was on responded to uh, Deepwater Horizon. So yeah. shout out to them. Um, but your role was a little bit different because you were you were more on the like the tactical side, right? You you were directly involved in the oil cleanup, right? Sure, I was I was a branch manager for got it's a long title, branch manager near shore cleanup, Barataria Bay out of Grand Isle, Louisiana. So those of no know Louisiana, Grand Isle is a little peninsula out there on the uh, southwest corner. It goes way out into the Gulf, and it's the last, it's the furthest point in Louisiana you can get in the Gulf. And uh, Barataria Bay is everything north of that. It goes almost all the way to New Orleans. And uh, there's lots of um, uh, lots of shallow islands there, you know, that might be a foot and a half or two above sea level. So it doesn't take much of a tide effect to completely inundate those things in oil, all the reeds. Um, mm. Some of the islands there don't exist anymore, like the Cat Islands and Bird Islands. Uh, if you look those up, they're gone just uh, from, e- from erosion. So, but islands come and go in the Gulf there. And uh, uh, we did what we could to get that oil picked up every day. I think at the high point, I remember seeing the... Uh, we have an IEP just for our area, the Incident Action Plan, and it lists the hierarchy and all of our personnel working. But uh, it had to be there were so many people working in different locations, you couldn't you couldn't publish it in one document because it would look like a phone book. I think at the high <laughs> point we had, I think there were over forty thousand workers responding to that at the high point. Um, that's a lot of Don soap. <laughs> like, it, I, is. it is. So it I was is. actually looking at just randomly. I was um, something crossed my LinkedIn page, and I saw something about uh, another oil spill and, and, and the buoys and um, like the just the difficulty because you have the the top. Like everybody looks at the oil on top of the water, but the real problem is under sure. the water, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, it, how do you even address those issues? You know, that's uh, it, it's so it's. It's such an overlooked area of oil spills. I, I think they call them class five oils. It's, it happens so infrequently, I'd have to look it up myself. But uh, mm. oils, if it's, if it's heavier than water, you know it sinks. So uh, we would put uh, oil absorber boom onto chains and drape that across the shallow part of the channel. And as the tide would sweep in back and forth, that would tell us how much of these class five oils are uh, being collected or, or underneath the uh, water that we can't see. And mix that with the, the, the amount of dispersant that we were using you know, an unprecedented amount of dispersant pumped into one area in such a short uh, period and such a large volume. I mean, the after effects of that would take in years. It's, they're still studying it, the after effects. Mm. And that, that changes the dynamic. It makes, makes collecting oil more difficult when you use dispersants as well. Yeah, there's lots of natural and man-made disasters that I would get excited about to like join on the mm-hmm. response. An oil spill just sounds like the worst. It sounds like really difficult from an ecological standpoint from a community standpoint and li- livelihoods. I mean, livelihoods sure. change when, you know, the, the fishing communities, it just sounds really, really complex. And I want to say it's like the worst, but it sounds, um, it, you know, it definitely would test people for sure what, what they, um, they had to do. And, and as you noted, uh, deep water horizon definitely was a game changer in, um, in that. So, yeah. Some of the after actions. Now we're we're looking eleven years out. You know, it's a it's a really interesting year. Twenty twenty one is an interesting year because eleven years after, ten years after um, the the tsunami in Japan, which was a game changer for um, mitigating earthquakes and tsunamis, and eleven years after Deepwater Horizon, and how many years after Hurricane Katrina, and we're twenty year yeah. mark for nine uh, eleven. Sure. And um, you know, with with all that thought processes in mind what is what were some of the biggest takeaways from um, from that oil spill that you think should be being applied right now especially in an emergency management perspective certainly pre- preparedness you know in a in a response especially to a, a chemical incident or oil spill uh, um, time time is uh, is geography you know as things are spreading out um the, the farther they spread that is the larger the more radius you got to deal with, the more area covered, and uh, the more assets you're going to need to deal with it. And it also reaches uh, more critical sensitive areas. Uh, and 
So time is time is money. Time is response. And so preparedness is for me, prepare, preparedness for me would be the, the key takeaway. Um, they just don't have they don't have robust uh, response systems in a lot of areas around the nation where the, there's a lot of marine shipping. Okay, so let's address that then. If you're going to talk about preparedness and you're going to, if you had the ear to the people who do this, what would you say? Like, how do you prepare for this? So I actually wrote my capstone at Georgetown about this very project. And, Perfect. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I would model it around the Alaska program. As you know, the Alaska North Slope crude is drilled up in uh, the north, the North Slope of the uh, Arctic Sea. It is pumped through an 800 plus mile pipeline to Valdez, Alaska. That is the southernmost port that is ice free year round. If it does get iced over, it's just a, a thin layer and the boats have no problem navigating it. In response to the Valdez oil spill, they uh, and in the, the permitting requirements to move that oil, the industry is required to maintain uh, the vessel of opportunity program and a standing contingent of oil spill response personnel with the rest of the equipment on, that they would need for worst case uh, with definite and tested mobilization times. And these. These drills are, are performed, you know, once a year or, or twice a year as needed to prove to the state and the feds that uh, the system they put in place can respond to, uh, you know, a 50 percentile type accident or incident. And then worst case, how long does it take you to ramp up to another Valdez uh, size of spill? I would like to see that program implemented elsewhere, you know, uh, with, where the fishermen are trained to respond with their vessels because they know the waters, uh, they, know the, they know the area, they know the climate, they know what to expect weather-wise. Um, you give them the tactics and the equipment, they can do a lot of work in a short period of time. Yeah, that's really smart, actually. Less, yeah. Like, all disasters are local anyways, so you might as well use the locals who are your true SMEs. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, if you look at it pragmatically, the, uh, they're not going to be fishing because you can't fish in an oil spill. So uh, the, the vessels will be available. They're larger vessels per, you know, than the typical boat. Uh, and these guys know the water. Yeah, that's smart. So that, that kind of big, because you actually spent time in Alaska, right? I mean, you've, yeah. you've been yeah. up there checking them. So, yeah. okay. I kind of I briefly, just briefly touched on that. Maybe we'll get back to that one later. But between Deepwater Horizon, yeah. actually reviewing and doing a capstone on what's happening in Alaska, and then more of the Seaburn side with, uh, with what happened in Kuwait. Sure. I mean, you have a ton of experience of dealing with oil. Actually, I, all my listeners are going to be like, wait, what? Can you talk say, about what happened in Kuwait and your role in that? Sure. So after, after Saddam Hussein pulled back out of Kuwait, he blew everything up. And that was the initial round of oil well fires. Well, several years later, all of these rebuilt rigs were having issues and they were blowing up from uh, you know, pro improper maintenance or sabotage from uh, insurgents or, or, or inside uh, locals that, uh, for whatever reason, wanted to uh, disrupt the system. So they recalled another contingent of personnel to come back. So I was in the second round that got to go back over there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You have some crazy stories with that. Maybe we can get to that a little yeah. bit later, but <laughs> kind of my, my, my point is like you, your, your career, you've touched oil a lot. You've touched fire probably more yeah. and some of these other crazy disasters, but you've touched oil a lot. And so sure. we don't really get political on this show, so we can kind of stay out of that. Yeah. But this pipeline <clears throat> that we keep yeah. hearing that's going across and Biden just put like president Biden just put a, up, you know, pump the brakes on it. Uh, is that a that was an automobile slash oil pun? I don't know. Um, yeah. What 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 is your thoughts on it? Is it safe? I mean, that's the, kind of the bottom line. Well, it's such it's such a double edged sword because uh, pipelines are are magnitudes more safer than the second most way to move oil, and that is by tanker. The third uh, the third safest way to move oil is by a tanker car, and the fourth would be by buckets and backpacks. You know, so <laughs> knowing pipelines pipelines could run decades without an incident of any type. Um, the Olympic Pipeline in Washington pumps oil from uh, Anacortes and Cherry Point Refinery from there, services almost all of the Puget Sound region, all the way down to Portland International Airport, and I think further south. And I don't know how many decades of, of service it was in. It wasn't until um, they had a rupture, a leak gasoline into a little valley, some kids were playing, and it erupted in a fire, and these kids died. That, until that point, most people didn't even know where the pipeline was. Now, the equivalent... The equivalent, I can't remember how many hundreds of thousands or millions of gallons a day moved through that pipeline, but it was something like 2,000 tractor trailers a day going from Cherry Point, which is North Washington by the Canadian border, all the way down to Portland, Oregon and further south every day. They'd have to do that round trip. So you could just do the math in your head, 2,000 tractor trailers plus a day, uh, you know, what are, the, what, are the, what are the statistics there? You know? Yeah, 
definitely more accidents, yeah, for sure. Sure. So, but when it comes to the key, Keystone Pipeline, it's run through some very sacred ground for the uh, the Native Americans in that area. So, um, it's it's you know what what do you do? You've got to negotiate and work out terms, tre uh, uh, honor the treaties we have in place, and and find a right of way that uh, everybody can live with. I like that. I like how you added that because that was kind of my I want to say hold up, but I. I I'm an emergency manager who likes to think of himself more of like the humanitarian side of him. I got an emergency manager because I like helping people. Like I, I, I genuinely do. I, I get a kick out of it. And um, I, I think it's fun to solve complex problems. And a big part of emergency management is including all the stakeholders to make sure that that coordination piece is, is up to date and, um, and, and as smooth as is possible. And so um I have another like weird thing that like, Oh, they were here first kind of thing. I don't know. But, um, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's definitely a complex issue. If they, do you think if, um, the media and I mean, it's kind of getting an opinion, so maybe we want to get out of it, but, um, like maybe things would be different if all the stakeholders were involved, you know, from the very beginning and that, that even that cost share, um, yeah. you know, something to think no, certain, about. You know, um, the problem is not all the stakeholders have the same weight, you know, uh, as you know, industry, especially in the oil has got, a, they've got a lot of weight. Uh, they get to dictate terms often. Um, they can use their, their power and mass to greet, not, I guess, grease the skids. You know, they have the lobby, they have a professional lobby working 24 seven on their behalf. Uh, yeah. The tribes, the tribes in the, you know, the plain States, they don't have that. Uh, it, yeah. So much is involved in politics, especially with lobbying, when lobbying gets involved. Yep. Uh, that's the one thing I'm okay to say. Like uh, politically, I'm not a fan of lobbyists, like in, in, in any industry, because you get you sure. just get hosed, right? But um, yeah, it's uh, we'll talk about an interesting situation. But I like how you said if you're going to do a pipeline, pipeline's the safest option to carry fuel, and yep. um, and go for decades, no issues. You should include the stakeholders. All those principles are emergency management principles of including the right people and doing it the right way. If you're going to move oil, that's the right way to do it. So, um, yep. you know, and great call outs there. And often, you know, the, the underrepresented population is just that they are the silent super minority and uh, they're off to the side and often forgotten. Yeah. And yeah, they're <laughs> the ones impacted the most, right? Oh, and definitely. Imagine if we did a, if we determined our stakeholders by who were impacted the most. Yeah. Oh yeah. Versus, who also knows the most something sure. that's been kind of driving me nuts about like the pandemic responses, people who, who I think know the most haven't really been involved. Like logistics, people who understand logistics, man, yeah. they should be all over this COVID thing because they know how to do supply chain. They don't know about cold chain. They know about warehousing and expirations and sure. um, how to do like mass distribution. And yet, you know, we're using, I, I think Steven Johnson, who's on the show last week, um, yeah. He said it right when he was like, you know, we're using people like doctors who, because it makes us feel comfortable. Like a doctor is going to get on there. You don't want to, they don't necessarily want somebody in logistics to do it. And, and yet that's the right person to use it. Yeah. Um, um, I was able to work logistics on COVID, uh, geez, April, May, June, July last year at, in DC at the, at the NRC. So <laughs> the right guy for the job. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. So talk to us about that. How much can you talk to us about that? <laughs> I can talk to you about it quite a bit. So as yeah, John may not have mentioned, but I'm a consultant in the private industry and every job I do, 99% um, of them have an NDA attached, a non-disclosure agreement with the very specific terms, like the job I'm on today, I can't really talk about, but I'm in St. Simons Island, Georgia. If you wanted to uh, look at the news here, it shouldn't be too hard <laughs> to figure out what I'm doing. Yeah. But knowing that, I was working the same this very project the last year at the same time. I live in Washington State. After three months, I want to take a break. I flew home. That was right when COVID was hitting. Everybody in the nation was, you know, what the heck is this going on here? They had the first death in Washington, and uh, I just happened to be there. So when I called my client back up, said, hey, I'm ready to mobilize again. My time off is up. Let's do this. Uh, they said, hey, hold on a minute. Let's, why don't you work remotely for a little bit? So mm -hmm. that lasted about a week before they realized uh, that it's not going to work out remotely to do operations and, uh, and uh, what I was doing. And... Uh, uh, we, we parted ways, which is no big deal. That happens all the time. I, you know, everything's got an end. Um, yeah. Reached out to another client to let them know I was available. And I was on a plane to Washington, D.C. to work at the National Response Center at FEMA headquarters. And uh, 
And uh, COVID was the hot topic, as you know, and that's what everybody was doing. Yeah. What's the name of your company again? Praetorian Fire Rescue. So they're about half a dozen of us that keep employed, you know, up and down. Sometimes it waxes and wanes. But as you know, as a small business, you uh, you just, you know, you, you, you like to keep the lights on. So you, you do what yeah. you can. No, I, I'm I'm the same way. So, like, we, we focus on a little bit different things. I, I, everybody knows that I have a small business as well. We're up to yep. 10 people as of today, which is a, it's a big win for us. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's been really exciting. But it, I kind of feel like, so let's talk about this for a little bit, because I think there's a lot of people out there who want to do what you do and are yeah. not able to do it. And quite frankly, sure. you're one of the best, so you're allowed. Um, but for, like, those people who are like, okay, I've been doing response for so long. I'm exhausted in right. response. I want to get into more of a consulting role. What would be your advice to, to some of those guys in the field right now? Sure. Professionally, uh, the most important thing you can do professionally is, uh, is network. You know, Georgetown was great. I just, uh, I don't know how many of the, the guys and gals from Georgetown, the professors that I keep in touch with, they will, uh, uh, Stephen Johnson, you mentioned, he was my advisor. He gave me some direction uh, that panned out to, another, you know, another six month gig for us. So that was great. Yeah. Um, I, every now and then we, you know, we keep in touch on Facebook. You'll see ads for short-term gigs or long-term gigs or even employment. Uh, a lot of our guys and gals are jumping on that. So um, networking, go to, go to the trade shows, go to the meetings, uh, a certified emergency manager, the CEM through IAEM, International Association of Emergency Managers. So not to, you know, throw a bone to those guys, but uh, that's helped out quite a bit. You know, there is, there really is no national standard for what an uh, emergency manager is. You know, in the West, 10 years ago, it, it could have been an employee at the sheriff's department that uh, is the local emergency manager. A lot of agencies in California or New York or Florida are blessed with a larger population, hence tax base, so they can have dedicated people to these positions. But a lot of rural places, they don't have that. So yeah. a, a national standard would be great. But getting back to what, um, what, you, to, what you use to succeed in this business, personally, uh, you have to define your role with your family because it killed my first marriage. You know, the, the mm -hmm. leaving for four months at a time, three months at a time, come home, uh, the phone would ring, you'd, you'd be leaving a, a couple of days later or hours later even. So that killed my first marriage. And uh, <laughs> I met a great gal, Aaron. Um, it's Aaron. And uh, we got married and uh, she understands my business. She knows what I'm in. But uh, at the same time, I set limits. I'm not going to work more than 180 years on the uh, 180 days on the road. You know, which sounds like a lot, but that's six months. That gives me another six months off at home. Yeah. Like, actually, there's that, all this that actually sounds really nice for people in our field, right? Like, yeah. um, I had to stop, I stopped traveling like the way I used to, um, the, the middle of the second Aaron got pregnant. Sure. Um, and you have it was easy, too. you know, before yeah. that, right? Like, like I would, I would get a call and then two hours later I'd be on a plane and I lived like that for years. And yeah. I wouldn't know when I was coming home. Like I have this funny story where Aaron was at the, uh, my wife's name was also Aaron and uh, she's at the grocery store. I couldn't get a hold of her. So I sent her a text message and I saw her six months later, you yeah. know, and, um, that's just the, the tempo now, now, um, doing it privately. It's, um, it's a huge win to be able to say like, Absolutely. okay, this is what we're going to work on. This is what we're not going to work, work on. And to be able to have a partner in the game who kind of understands that as well, like that's like big call out for sure. Sure, certainly. And, you know, we've got uh, we've got a Christian faith in our family, and that helps. You know, we pray nightly when I'm on the road, uh, take turns back and forth, and uh, and uh, that helps a lot. Um, it's just nice to have a foundation at home that you can rely on. Yeah, good call. Uh, <laughs> you know, praying at night. Uh, yeah. I once had a friend who kind of got in a hairy situation. And, you know, a lot of people struggle with relationships in this field, especially with being on the road so much. Yeah. And he was like, how do you keep it up, man? How do you like keep the fire alive? And I was like, I literally call my wife Zoom yeah. or FaceTime at the time. Yeah. FaceTime my yeah. wife every single night, no matter what. It could be three o'clock in the morning, her time. Like if I get, if I get 10 seconds, like, hey, just want to like touch base. Yeah. And uh, I think that's helped out big time. The other big thing that's helped out in my life, uh, hilariously, is Archer, the show nice. Archer. I would oh, get, yeah. I would just, I would get like slap happy tired, and I would throw that on TV when I was. There's one deployment I was on, and I would just, I like binge watched it at like, you know, four o'clock in the morning, nice. and um, gosh, just like being able to decompress and knowing how to decompress is a big help for sure. Yeah, 
Yeah. yeah. So if I was a spy, Archer would be the guy I'd want to be. He would uh, he'd be the one I'd model my career after. I don't know. You're pretty close going to Kuwait and going to all these crazy places. Yeah. Now you, but, uh, you know, uh, get back to family. It's, it's important to, to, to talk to them daily. You know, I talk to the, I have five daughters. Uh, I talk to them, you know, the older ones, you know, they got their own lives, got some children of their own popping out. And uh, um, I got to balance it with them. So I'm not crushing them daily, but we talk, you know, every other day at least. Um, the, yeah, uh, uh, Isabella is the youngest, and I talk to her almost every day. So, How old is Isabella? Isabel just turned 12 two weeks ago. So that's awesome. That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Happy birthday, Isabella, two days ago. Um, man. So in terms of like your story, cause we haven't even talked about the fire side. Sure. So like in terms of like top one, two, three experiences for you, de- career defining experiences where you're like, okay, this, this means something in my career. What were those for you? Or Personally, I it would be uh, it'd be working the youth detention, uh, the child unit reunification, 2018. You know that summer that uh, the children were housed in mass away from their parents. Um, I'd finished up work with Crowley Marine in Alaska after 12 years. Uh, they lost their prime contract, so that means that you know we all floated away. Mm-hmm. And uh, I did. I saw it as a good point to segue out of Alaska. At that point, I was still working uh, in Alaska month on month off. Um, I was going to the Georgetown program and back up a little bit. I was actually one of the first people to apply to the Georgetown program, got accepted, but then I had to defer it because of, just because of work, huh. the work time in Alaska. So that's how I ended up in your cohort, which was awesome. I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah. Well, good thing for it. me. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, uh, just a few weeks after I ended up, left Alaska, I found myself in El Paso, Texas in July uh, 2018, working on a contract with Human Health Services uh, on their incident command team that was assigned to uh, reunite parents and children together. And that was That's the most heartbreaking, cool. that was the most heartbreaking, one of the most heartbreaking jobs I've ever done. Um, reuniting we had to have parents? Parents, the parents with their children. Cause uh, at that point, families would come across the, uh, families would come across the border. The mm-hmm. children were separated from the parents. Parents would go to a federal detention center, uh, could be New Jersey, could be in Auburn, Washington. Children were, you know, housed at uh, the local center at Tornillo, El Paso. So, right with no indications of when they're getting back together. So I saw uh, children at, you know, young age, uh, even at their Izzy's age at that point, and, uh, you know, they're just, so it was heartbreaking. Uh, uh, when we get these parents and kids back together, um, sometimes it's overwhelming for them. They just, uh, they would collapse. They would collapse because they didn't think they were going to see their children anymore. So that was gut-wrenching. I had to call Aaron every day on that one and, uh, and uh, you know, l- let it out. Yeah, that's kind of a tough, um, yeah, tough one. Hold on, we're getting a little bit of feedback here. Okay. Um, see if it catches up. Oh, there it goes. Okay, good. Um, okay. Yeah, my, so first of all, before getting into my thoughts on that, the National I'm at West, FEMA, literally yeah. just out deployed it back out there to help out with that. So good luck, guys and girls. Um, Hopefully you can help out my thoughts on that. I mean, I, I haven't seen it up close. And so I, I'm going to say yeah. that, you know, so I, I take that with a huge grain of salt. Yeah. I talk with people from ice and I talk with friends who do uh, style, child sex trafficking. Yeah. And, um, you know, you have to keep kids away from adults for a certain amount of time for psychologically for the children to realize that, okay, I can tell somebody that that person is not my dad. That's Definitely. not my uncle. But at the same time, the idea of separating children from their parents, like I have two little kids yeah, and that just, that like breaks my heart. And there was a, there was a time when I was on the team where they were thinking about um, having FEMA step in. FEMA was in control of it. Then FEMA got out of it. And now FEMA's back in it. Yeah. And uh, there's like this middle ground where we were thinking about, assisting with the child separation policy. And I was like, I was, I I thought at that one point I was going to have to walk away because I was like, I just don't know how, like, yes, you want to protect children and there's 16,000 children we save a year. And yet there's, if this was any other border on any other country, the UN would be there and there would be camps set up. Yeah, definitely. So it's like, like, why is it not, I mean, that's a rhetorical question. Why isn't it a humanitarian crisis? You have so sure. many people coming. Maybe let's let's address it before it hits critical mass. I don't know. 
Um, yeah. Just nuts. Sure. You asked about uh, three incidents. So that'd be the one that uh, struck me personally the most. Uh, one of the funnest incidents I ever worked was the uh, Black Mountain 2 fire in uh, Missoula, Montana, 2003-ish. That was just a, it was just a blast um, working, that, working wildfires. Did they make that a movie? They made it out of a movie, sure. right? I don't know. I don't know. I haven't kept up on that. But uh, that fire was just a blast. I had a, I had a dozen of my crews out working, and uh, everything was raging and burning, and uh, it was a firefighter's dream to work that incident. So you've been in at least two movies now, Deepwater Horizon <laughs> and the Montana Wildfires. Okay. What was the third one, movie star? <laughs> yeah, it'd probably, be the, it'd probably be the oil spill in, uh, in the Gulf, uh, you know, 2010. That was, okay. uh, that was, as far as oil spills go, that was, I uh, hope it doesn't get beat, but here we are. Yeah, that's a, when we did Mendocino Complex, and yep. uh, I was like, I was like, I'm in the worst wildfire in California state history. Yep. I didn't realize it was going to be beat the next year or two years sure. later. Yeah. Like, you talk about the, the campfire. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. So I worked that all of 2019, almost I worked the recovery there, working the, the debris operations. Uh, you know, we got four plus million tons of uh, debris off the ground for office of emergency man uh, services and uh, uh, Cal recycle. Mm -hmm. So getting, when we mobilized in January, January 6th, we met in Sacramento there, uh, got debriefed up and went up to Paradise on our orientation tour with the, the command team. And the only two colors there were gray and black. I mean, I've never seen devastation like that before in my career. I mean, the, the career firefighters that brought me on to work with them were, uh, they'd said the same thing. It's like, we, we do this for career in California, debris operations after the fires. And uh, um, I was just blown away. It's just neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood of nothing. And then you'd find one house completely untouched. Uh, then yep. it'd be just, you go for another two miles and nothing, but burned up cars and uh, completely incinerated landscape right down to the soil. The, uh, I know exactly. I, I had, didn't my, I, I got off the team right before paradise, mm -hmm. but, um, in Napa, there was a, there was a huge neighborhood, uh, and it was just gone. It looked, it, it looked like a cross between an atomic bomb had gone off <laughs> and, like a painting because the engine blocks had melted and were on yeah. the ground. Oh, yeah. Yep. And just a, just a puddle, just a puddle of aluminum and just, to, just run, just run down the, the little ravine. Yeah. It, it's like, it doesn't like they're made to combust. It doesn't, it doesn't like comprehend. Like you see this and you're like, it's just yeah. gray ash everywhere. And um, like in a hurricane, you see the remnants of houses, you see the roofs sure. ripped off, you see the mud everywhere, but you see a neighborhood. Yeah. You know, in a tornado, the same thing. Tornado is really rough too because it just it looks like each house had its own bomb. Yeah, when you see an entire neighborhood or neighborhoods gone. Yep. It, oh man, it takes, a toll. It's wild. it takes a toll on you. And plus, we had to liaise. Our team had to liaise with every homeowner that we were involved with cleaning up the properties, and uh, um, uh, it takes a lot of empathy. You know, listen to their stories day after day of this the worst day in their life, and uh, all they have left. There was a gal I met named Donna. She's a little older. When she escaped her house, she literally had one sock on and her underwear. That was it. Um, her entire neighborhood was on fire. A sheriff skidded to a stop, put her in the back seat with like seven or eight other people, and that's how she escaped. The only thing she had left was three articles of clothing. Uh, everything else was incinerated. Yeah, that's. it's hard to process that. Yeah, I talk a lot about mental health on this show because I've also had some experiences where it's like, mm -hmm. I don't want to say too much to bear, but emotion, like uh, it's kind of, I'm kind of a weird guy. Like I can be joking and laughing one second yeah. with one person. And then all of a sudden I'm in, in a response and I have to be super serious and I go right back yeah. at the same time. Like I think it might be a coping mechanism a little bit. You know, it is. Yeah. yeah. How, how do you deal with it for those guys in the uh, field? who are like sh shaking their head right now, or that, that woman who's sitting in her car right now, who's just like, you just explained my whole life. How do you deal with it? Sure. So with the firefighters I work with on that job, particularly, uh, we would talk every night. We would get together. We would eat meals together, uh, have a, a, a social drink, and uh, go back to base camp, which was, you know, 75 or 80 RVs in the dirt on the other side of the uh, Chico airport. Cause that's, all they, that's the only place they had. Every hotel room was taken by displaced persons. Every Airbnb, VRBO, every rental, every condo was full of displaced persons. So our, our base camp was literally just asphalt and tents, or, I'm sorry, uh, RVs. 
So we, yeah. we would get together and uh, that's, that's who we'd share our, our, share our day with. Yeah. You know, those guys are great working with them. Yeah. I, and, I, I'm, I'm the same way. I, I talk it out. No one talk it out, but like, I just, I just hang out with like people who get it. Yeah. Yeah. It helps out a lot. It, it helps out to know, like, you know, you can decompress together in, in, in a, in some kind sure. of way. That common experience, that common, uh, you know, that common knowledge, what you have, because they just, they've seen the same thing you saw just two or three hours before and they, they get it. You know, I don't care who you are. Even the hardest of firefighters. Yeah. 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 Even the hardest of firefighters, the hardest of medics, uh, they, uh, I've seen them break down. They, they, they need to break down and talk about it. You can't take this stuff home with you. You can't bottle it up. I had a, I had a really good friend of mine who, uh, I came up to his car as 103, 110 degrees outside windows sure. up, car off, and just curled up in a ball, bawling in his car. Threw open yeah. the car door. I just gave him, you know, I'm not really a huggy type, but I just gave him like this big bear hug for like 20 minutes. He was just bawling on my shoulder. And like after that, he was fine. He was totally good. But he like needed yeah. to get that, to get that out. And he needed to know he wasn't alone. And um, quite frankly, we don't talk about that enough. That's why I always bring it up because like, bad things happen when we don't talk about it. I, I'm sure you and I both know people who, um, you know, for one extreme or the other, you know, didn't go, didn't take care of it the right way. And so this is just a, a call out, um, sure. kind of super deep for this conversation that, you know, but, uh, I think it's important for people to hear it and, uh, you know, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, there's too, a lot of, you know, like just one more point on that is uh, there's too many responders that turn to alcohol or, or a uh, drug abuse or, you know, or have anger issues from bottling this stuff up. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I <laughs> have a crazy, sto- a crazy <laughs> story of a friend turning around. To me, like I tapped a buddy on a, of mine on a, on his shoulder at a bar and he turned around and grabbed my neck and he started yelling at me in Arabic. And I was like, Hey buddy, um, I'm here. It's, you know, you're in, yeah. you're in the U S and, um, the next day he came up to me and he was like, Hey, I'm like, I'm so, I'm so sorry for that. I was like, Hey, First of yeah. all, learn my lesson. Never come up to somebody behind their back and start talking to them, especially yeah. at a bar. Uh, the, the second thing was like, hey, maybe it's time to, to address what was going on there. And uh, it's just it's just crazy. So, yeah, good call out. And it's not always extreme either. Sometimes sometimes you don't know. Like sometimes it doesn't feel like it's taking a toll and you're totally fine. But I think it's just a smart idea to just feel like without having to explain the, the incident or whatever, they get around like-minded people every once in a while. Um, not all the time. Don't do like the whole Facebook thing where you cut off everybody who doesn't think like you, sure. but um, yeah, really great call out there. Thanks. So most interesting man in the world. Um, <laughs> I don't know if to call you that or a superstar now because uh, you're a movie star. Cause Oh my gosh. But um Man, it's just crazy to think about. Like, and and the stories that I that I know about you outside of this podcast, obviously. Sure. Um, what got you into this field? Were you military? No, no. Uh, Dad's military. My sister's military. She's in the Air Air Force. You know, she's a, a career reservist, I guess you'd call it, because she does more reserve time than she does her uh, King County uh, to job. But. Uh, mm. Um. So I was going to college like a lot of guys, you know, and had had no clue what I wanted to do except for hang out with uh, with people and, uh, you know, get some D's and C's and a few courses and see what's out there. Had a summer job working wildfire for Washington DNR and uh, I was like, hey, man, that's pretty cool. So awesome. after that, uh, um, went to work for DNR, Washington DNR for one season, fighting fires. Uh, and I was at the base camp. You know, that's back when they had tables about chest high. You would eat your meals on because nobody had time to get chairs out or sit on a chair. <laughs> met a contractor and I was like, wait, you're a contractor? He's like, yeah. He's like, I got my own, yeah, they had their own, he had his own fire truck. He said, hell, that's cool. That kicks butt. And yeah. after that, I bought a couple of trucks and uh, had a good season the next year and uh, went to work with the government again as a contractor. And we doubled the company size every year for about five years until it just got unmanageable. And uh, wow. my, my naivety had caught up to me in the summer of 2006. And uh, while operationally we couldn't be beat, we had brand new trucks and, uh, and great people. Uh, administratively, that's where I was lacking. I had no formal education in business management, uh, working with loans of the banks or the SBA or even federal biz ops to get contracts and the USDA and their procurement processes. And at one point we were spending 80,000 bucks a month on truck payments. So uh, that had caught up to us. And 
I did not realize that having all your ducks or all your eggs in one basket is a bad thing in con the contracting world when, you know, 95% of your income is from one contract and mm. uh, the government uh, on a whim could just turn it off. You know, that, uh, that bites. So graduated yeah. from that. Uh, I saw the writing on the walls. I have no clue what I'm doing. I don't know how we're so successful. Started uh, segueing into other industries. That was the oil spill and uh, chemical uh, spill response, hazmat, and uh, doing other jobs. And, uh, Got away from got away from the trucks, mm. and that's a cutthroat business now. I mean, those guys will those guys will pop your tires, and uh, I'm just kidding. They will. Uh, uh, everybody, the rates today are not much more than they were 25 years ago. So if that really? tells you something. That tells yeah, you that still, the the market went like that. So mm. there's 10 times the trucks there were. There might be five times the work, but now there's 10 times the trucks there were 20 years ago. So there's just uh, supply and demand. Trucks are available, crews are available, so the rates the rates didn't climb much. Which is nuts because you think about yeah. what happens every year here in California yep. and or West Coast. Um, talk about a cultural shift that needs to happen. Sure. Going, taking, putting money in the right places. Help out yeah. the guys. And, geez, that's nuts. Um, that's cool, though, that you're a smart. Talk about interest. Yeah. Of course, you had a crazy story of, oh, hey, I just <laughs> took off this business. 80, 80 grand a month. Yeah. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> um, that's really funny, actually. Of course, of course, you have that story. But uh, it's, it's smart that you saw kind of the writing on the wall and you saw what you're good at and what you're not good at. And so you started. Uh, I, I think that's really good advice, too. I think we sometimes we get looped into roles. I went from ops and planning to GIS. Yeah. And talk about like, whew, like that was just so far off, like what my normal track was. And. I started to realize that was pitching and hold. That was like a pitch and hold pretty fast. And I also didn't sure. have a degree. I knew, I knew the stuff and I knew what people wanted. And I could get the job done. No problem. Yeah. But I was like, this is going to keep heading this direction. So I, I immediately, you know, and it made another turn. And yeah. um, I think it's okay to do that. You know, you don't need to rush per se, but you know, if, you, if you're seeing that in your career, like it's okay to like bounce around a little bit and it makes you more well-rounded. Obviously it's made you more rounded, sure. well-rounded. Yeah. Turns out I'm, I'm really good at logistics, but I, I hate doing that on incidents. Um, it's, I just find it, as you know, logistics, you're kind of tied to a computer. You're, you're tied to the warehouse. You're tied to uh, the, uh, the, the facilities managers, that kind of thing. And I like to be a little more mobile. So mm. I like to be in operations more, but that's where, that's where my heart's at. But I'm really good at logistics, so I get sucked into those roles, and I'll say, <laughs> okay, let's do this. Yeah. yeah. Well, obviously, you helped out with COVID, so you yeah. must be pretty good with logistics. Sure. Um. Okay. Well, our time's wrapping up, but I have to ask because you've had so many different kinds of experiences. Sure. What would be your advice? How do you change? Emergency management is really young industry. And so yeah, I like to have everybody come on here and say, okay, if you're going to change one thing about our field, one advice, what would you change? I would come up with some type of national standard, some type of, some type of licensing as far as a, a minimum. Because like I said, uh, I'll show up in an incident and uh, oh God, this is great. She's here. She's the best. And I'll show up in another incident. I was like, oh, my God, this guy's still in the business. How, does, how has he not killed? <laughs> but uh, there's just such a, there's such a gambit from the, the people that uh, I've done and do and know and the people that are just, uh, just there by name. You know, I know everybody's got to get some experience, but it seems like the people, if you're charismatic and you're well-liked and you're in the, the, the cliquish club at a lot of agencies, those are the stars that rise to the top, even though they're not qualified. They don't have the life experience to have difficult conversations or they haven't developed a management style or they haven't been in the field to see what, you know, to see what disaster actually looks like or how it impacts the, the guys that live down in the, the brush but underneath the river. They, they don't take that into account. I think you need a little bit of life experience. You need uh, some education, not to say that uh, people rising up through the ranks can't do it either, but uh, there has to be some type of standard task books, maybe, you know, I don't have task books for every other, for every other, uh, incident you know if you want to be a division supervisor on a wildfire or you want to respond to uh, hurricanes you know they got, they got, we have task books for these things yeah that's a good point um yeah i've had i've had several people on here to talk about that point and i hear both mm -hmm. ends of the spectrum and i that is why i'm not a fan of cem um yeah see i don't trust people with cem nope. i don't trust like he all they've done is take a a, a test to say that yeah. they passed FEMA's free test and they've, they've, they've been to an exercise essentially, sure. but I like the idea of CEM. In fact, Todd DeVoe 
uh, he's been bothering me lately because he he gave a he gave a like just like you gave a really good pitch for it, and he basically said it's something is better than nothing. Yeah, and um, I'm like, okay, you're right. I I would I would like it to be much more like a law school. If people sure. really understood like what responses and life saving and life sustaining, mm-hmm. and they meet some of these people who go out there who don't know how to do life saving. Uh, life-sustaining operations or even have the ability to say oh right we forgot about the social vulnerability uh, index which is incredibly important for response and who it impacts the most right and um to like to integrate education like i would i would love i mean i love your point i would love to see schools integrate with a national standard so when you graduate school there is an yeah. expectation that you're going to take a, not a simple test like the CEM, but like a, a very difficult test uh, to get a license, national license. Sure. And also that to set you up with actual experiences, like s- schools, my, my undergrad did a really great job because they required us to have, well, they strongly encouraged us to get internships. And so I was with the Red Cross for a while and I'd already been with reaching efforts yeah. and I, I'd done some other stuff. And so like, I felt like I had a basis of understanding of like tactics versus um, operation or uh, tactics versus strategic. Yeah. And um, I think it's important for people to understand both those because you need to think strategically as an emergency manager, but you always sell it tactics. Yeah. So I'm going to talk too much about that, but I I'm a hundred percent on the same page. I think that's a great call out. Yeah. So appreciate that. Yeah, of course. So let me pull, tee this up here real quick. Eric, thank you so much for coming on the show. Like you're obviously well experienced, and uh, you set the bar pretty high for people who want to do it, especially privately. Um, and you show you show us how you can jump around quite a bit, and um, to know what you're good at, and to know you know where you shift. You see, lots of good advice there. So, hey, thanks again for coming on the show. Always a pleasure, John. All right. So, everybody, of course, if you like this episode, if you want to say thanks to Eric, you can do it a couple of different ways. You can give us that five-star rating and subscribe, which, of course, you should be doing the Disaster Tough podcast. We're going to be posting more about Eric on our main uh, page for social media, the Disaster Tough podcast on Instagram. We're also going to be posting on social media, other social media channels like YouTube, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, and Twitter. So check out all the channels. See what platform is best for you. Make sure you subscribe. If you have a question for Eric, there's always two ways you can do it. Lots of people like to send me emails, which is great. We like that. Info at DobermanEMG.com. However, what we would really like is for people to go onto Instagram and to post a question or a comment, something you liked, and so that we can respond there. Um, We're really excited for uh, these kinds of episodes, so help us keep on uh, doing them by responding and showing us that you like it. Thanks.